Thanks, Tony. Okay, welcome everybody for our seventh speaker in the Compass Lecture Series of the Spring 2023 semester, uh, Nathan Sanford. Nathan is currently a sixth and final year PhD student and NSF fellow in the UC Berkeley Department of Astronomy, working under the supervision of Professor Dan Weitz. His research broadly revolves around the chemical evolution of the Milky Way and its neighboring galaxies, which can be used to study a wide range of stellar and galactic physics. Before attending UC Berkeley, Nathan earned his bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy from Pomona College. While at Pomona College, he participated in undergraduate summer research programs at Carnegie Observatories and SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory on projects related to galaxy evolution and dark matter, respectively. After he completes his PhD this coming summer, Nathan will be trading his lifelong California residency to become an astronomy postdoc position at the University of Toronto in Ontario, Canada. Outside of work, Nathan enjoys cooking and spending quality time with his partner, Grace and Kat Flamingo. He believes that getting involved with the UC Academic Workers Union and related campus-wide organizing efforts was one of the most pivotal, empowering, and rewarding decisions that he made during his time at Berkeley. And I will snap to that. Um, without further ado, please welcome Nathan. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here and to talk about some of the, the science that I've done over the course of my PhD and the, the parts of the science that, that interested me the most. Um, broadly, this is, uh, I'll be talking about the stellar chemistry in the faintest and farthest local group galaxies. Um, but let's start with uh, a brief overview of the talks so we kind of know where we're, we're headed. Um, I want to start by giving a good solid uh, foundation in uh, low mass galaxies and why these are especially interesting astrophysical uh, systems to study um, as well, as especially their, their chemical evolution and what that can tell us about the underlying uh, physics of galaxy formation. Um, and then I'll move to talk about a specific uh, study um, I performed recently on the chemical evolution of Eridanus II, which is a, a very low mass galaxy um, around the Milky Way. Um, and I, I wanna really highlight you know, focus on these first two points. And so I encourage everybody to kind of ask me questions if I skip over anything um, or anything doesn't make sense. Because um, I think these are really the, the fundamental parts of, of the research, what, you know, is motivating me to do this science. Um, and then if I've got time remaining, I'll talk kind of about some of the more uh, technical aspects um, uh, of the, the work I've been doing to push kind of the limits of what we can measure in terms of stellar chemistry using uh, existing and, and future spectrographs um, in these in these small uh, distant galaxies. So starting with uh, why low mass galaxies, um, low mass galaxies are interesting for for a lot of reasons. These galaxies kind of represent the extreme end of of galaxy formation. They're some of the oldest uh, galaxies forming in the really early universe. They form out of very pristine gas that haven't been enriched by later generations of stars, as I'll talk about soon. Um, they also, you know, are, end up being the building blocks of more massive galaxies as they merge together over cosmic time. And so to understand, you know, massive galaxy growth, you also have to understand the small galaxies. Um, these low mass galaxies are also very dark matter dominated. Um, they're by, by mass, they're, you know, uh, composed of primarily this mysterious invisible dark matter that we're still unsure about. Um, and a much smaller fraction, like less than 1% of their mass is actually made up of, of stars and gas. And so by, you know, because of this, these, these galaxies are really good laboratories for stuttering, studying the composition and nature of dark matter. And also because they're so teeny tiny, they, they have very shallow gravitational potential wells. Um, and so as you can see in the simulation of a low mass galaxy evolution, they're very sensitive to injections of energy from supernovae, which, which can disrupt or, or blow out gas and otherwise puff them up. So for, for a lot of the reasons that dwarf galaxies are really interesting to study, they're also, um, uh, for many of those reasons, they're also very difficult to study. Um, you know, they are small, they are faint, um, frequently diffuse, as you can see in these images on the right, they just look kind of like smudges. Um, and so they're very difficult to observe. Um, and this is especially true if we look to the very, in the very distant universe, um, into the very early universe, um, they become incredibly hard to impossible to actually study in, in any amount of detail. And this is even with, you know, powerful new instruments like JWST. They just are, remain beyond um, our reach. Yes. Right. 
yeah, good question. Um, so the Milky Way, uh, oh, sorry, yes, thank you. Um, this is the question is, you know, what, what do I mean by low mass in terms of like relative to the Milky Way? Um, the Milky Way's uh, stellar mass is about 10 to the 10 um, solar masses. Um, so 10, 10 billion times the mass of the sun. Uh, low mass galaxies, um, you know, there, there's not like a hard cutoff, but um, a lot of times people kind of use 10 to the eight Solar mass is kind of on the large end to refer to dwarf galaxies, so 100 times smaller than the Milky Way. Um, Eridanus II, which I'll talk about later, is 10 to the five solar masses, so about 100,000 times smaller than the Milky Way. Um, and that is not, you know, uh, that continues to kind of the, the limits of our, of our detectability of them. You know, it, I think, is an open question about how small they actually get. Cool. So um, fortunately, we don't have to go very far to find low mass galaxies. Our local group, which is the, our neighborhood of galaxies, includes the Milky Way and Andromeda or, or M31, our nearest neighboring spiral galaxy. Um, our local group is full of, of low mass dwarf galaxies. Um, at present, we know of about 80 of them, but more and more are being discovered as, as sensitive surveys are finding more smaller and fainter and more diffuse ones. Um, and a really important part about all of these low mass galaxies in the local group is that uh, they are close enough that we can actually resolve their individual stars that make up their galaxy. So instead of studying the full galaxy all at once, kind of like as a blob, we can actually break it apart and see individual stars that make it up. Um, and that's really powerful because these stars that we are seeing are very old stars um, and they, uh, provide a tracer for what the galaxy was like when those stars formed. They lock up the gas at the time of their birth. And so we can use you know, both their motions in space to tell us something about how the dynamics of the galaxy have evolved. And what I'll be spending most of this talk talking about is it also tells us about how the chemistry of the galaxy evolved over time. Um, so let's, let's dive into it. Um, how many people have, are familiar with this version of the periodic table? Okay, great, awesome. I'm showing people new things, which is awesome, that's my goal. Um, so this is the standard periodic table, except that we've color coded each element um, by uh, the nuclear synthetic origin, what astrophysical process produced those elements. Because in the very early universe, we just have hydrogen and helium, a little bit of lithium, and like really, really trace amounts of boron. But uh, we're all walking around, we all have other elements that are uh, more massive than just those elements. Um, and these are all produced by astrophysical processes, largely stars. If you're familiar with the Carl Sagan quote, we're all made of star stuff. This is what he was referring to. Um, I won't go into detail about every single element, but I do wanna provide like an overview of the main uh, processes that are producing these elements and what elements kind of correspond with each process. The first is uh, that I wanna talk about are core collapse supernovae. These are the explosions of massive stars when they reach the end of their life. Um, massive stars have relatively short lifespans, uh, astronomically speaking, of 10 to 100 million years. Um, that's long for us, but short in the grand scheme of things, because the universe is 13 plus billion years old. So these are relatively short uh, timescales between when the star was born and when they explode and um, release uh, elements. They produce primarily uh, alpha elements, um, which I've highlighted here in blue, it's a little difficult to see on the screen, but these are elements like oxygen and magnesium, silicon, calcium, um, as well as light odd elements like sodium, aluminum, potassium. Uh, another uh, predominant uh, mode of nuclear synthesis in the universe are type 1a supernovae. These are the explosions of white dwarfs. White dwarfs are the stellar remnants that are formed when lower mass stars reach the end of their lives. Um, they explode either because the mass has been transferred from a companion star like the red giant star shown in this illustration, or potentially when two white dwarfs coalesce together. They explode and they predominantly produce uh, elements around iron on the periodic table. And so we refer to these as, as iron peak elements. Um, to get elements that are further down to heavier elements on the periodic table, we have to, uh, th these are formed through neutron capture. Um, of 
So you have elements, these lighter elements that are seed nuclei, and then you bombard them with neutrons. And slowly they capture neutrons and various nuclear physics happens. And then you produce uh, these heavier elements. Um, if the capturing of neutrons is relatively slow compared to uh, various decays, um, ra various radioactive decay, um, you get elements that are produced through slow neutron capture or S process. Um, this happens in the atmospheres of uh, old low mass stars in the kind of final stages of their life. They form these through various convections of their atmosphere and then release them out into the universe through their winds. Um, for this reason, they also enrich on longer time scales because of the, the lifetimes of these low mass stars. Um, if you have a slow process, you also have a fast process or a rapid process, and this is the R process. Um, and these elements are primarily produced, we believe, through neutron star mergers. So when these massive stars explode, they can leave behind black holes or they can leave behind neutron stars. If you have two neutron stars, you have a lot of neutrons around. And when they coalesce and merge, um, they uh, produce these uh, R process elements. Um, I should say some examples of slow neutron process elements are like strontium, barium, and rapid elements, uh, rapid R process elements are things like thorium and uranium. So this is a, a lot of information, uh, um, even just these four different nucleosynthetic channels. I've told you that they uh, are the progenitors of these events are stars of different masses. They produce elements, different uh, elements, to different ratios on different time scales. Um, and this gets even more complicated when you start uh, looking into and realizing that the production of elements depends on the initial composition of the star or even just how fast that star is rotating. There's a lot of work being done to, to iron out these details. Um, but ignoring all of that, um, it turns out that the complexity of, of this um, the system of various stars of different masses on different time scales producing different elements um, actually allows you to kind of unweave uh, the uh, chemical abundance pattern that you find in a star um, because of the differences in time scales and the difference of star, uh, stellar masses that are contributing to each. You can then use the abundances, the chemical composition of a star to, to disentangle the various astrophysics behind that um, and learn things about the stellar evolution and learn about the galaxy evolution. And here's just like a little schematic of all of the various ways that, that gas is flowing in a galaxy, forming stars, being ejected from stars, being ejected from the galaxy, forming new stars. Um, so that's a lot, but let's, let's simplify it down a bit and just think about two different elements and what a galaxy might look like, what the, a, a galaxy stars might look like. Um, in, in that element space. So here I showed a Tinsley Wallerstein diagram named after two early pioneers of galactic chemical evolution. On the x-axis is the iron abundance of stars um, with things that are relatively uh, poor in iron on the left side and more iron rich on the right. And then on the y-axis, I'm plotting the ratio of, of alpha elements to iron elements in a star. And the reason why this ratio specifically is chosen uh, I hope will become apparent um, as I walk through this slide. So early on, um, we start at, at low iron abundance. I might slip up and say metallicity, in which in case I'm usually referring to the iron abundance, iron being a good uh, proxy for kind of bulk enrichment of, of elements heavier than hydrogen. So at early times, we start at, at low iron abundance. And as core collapse supernovae start exploding, because remember, these are the events that happen on the shortest time scales, we evolved to, to higher iron abundance. And this evolution, um, as iron is produced and then formed into new stars, happens at an elevated alpha over iron ratio. And this is elevated because um, these core collapse supernovae produce primarily alpha elements. They produce iron, but they also, they, but they produce more alpha elements to iron elements. Then after a certain time, uh, it's been long enough that uh, some of the lower mass stars have formed into white dwarfs and those white dwarfs have now exploded. And so now you have the galaxy enriching itself through a combination of both explosive uh, core collapse supernovae as well as type 1a supernovae of white dwarfs. And so we continue to evolve to higher iron abundance. But now you'll see that the alpha over iron ratio starts decreasing. And this is because now that these type 1a supernovae are going off, they're producing iron uh, nearly 
entirely iron and, and very little alpha elements. And so this depresses the alpha over iron ratio. So this is kind of how an, a galaxy might evolve um, through constant time of just allowed to form stars and, and enrich itself. What can you learn about a galaxy through these observations? Um, just qualitatively, um, the, the height of this high alpha plateau can tell you things about the distribution of stellar masses that, that are formed, the ratio of high mass stars to low mass stars, um, and the details of the, the nucleosynthesis that happens in those, those high mass stars. Um, various aspects of this kind of knee in the distribution, and uh, for lack of a better word, the, the leg, um, uh, the shape and, and angle and extent of that leg contain a whole bunch of information about how long it takes for those type 1a supernovae to start going off, um, how fast and how efficiently the galaxy is turning its gas into stars, um, and how that galaxy might be accreting new pristine gas um, or ejecting enriched gas out. And just to kind of double down on how densely informative this uh, parameter or this uh, this observational space is, even the scatter around this evolutionary track is in informative. Um, and it can tell you things about how random uh, these nuclear synthetic events are. If things are uh, very rare and happen randomly, then there's a lot of scatter around this distribution. And if they happen frequently um, and homogeneously, then it's a much tighter relation. Um, so now if you add, you can add additional elements from different nuclear synthetic processes, and um, this gives you additional constraining power for these various galactic physical, uh, galactic physics. Um, but it turns out that if you go the other direction too, and you like only have measurements of iron abundance, and so all you can measure is this kind of distribution um, uh, of iron abundances. Uh, we call this a metallicity distribution function, but it's essentially just a histogram of stars as a function of their, their iron abundance. This itself is actually quite informative. And it's this uh, observation that I'll be focusing on specifically as we uh, go into talk about uh, Eridanus too. Yeah, so the question is, uh, I, I've been kind of referring to like movement from left to right on this figure as an evolution through time when that's not, the, that's not the access label I put on it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the reason for this is, um, is under the assumption that a galaxy is only becoming more enriched in elements, it's frequently uh, used where the, the iron abundance of a star is mapped onto time, where at early times there's very little uh, iron in a, in, in a really, really old star that was formed when the galaxy was just pristine gas, that iron abundance is really low. After several generations of stars, much later in time, if a star forms, it's going to have the, the same chemical composition as the, the galaxy's composition at that time, which will be much more enriched in iron. And so it's not a direct one-to-one -one mapping between uh, millions of years to like iron abundance. In fact, um, it's, a, a, it's a very poor mapping. Um, and there's been a lot of arguments that you shouldn't use iron here because the type 1a supernovae have a weird delay to them. And you should do it in terms of some alpha abundance instead, um, because the alpha abundance maps to uh, the more prompt or collapse supernovae. So that is much better mapped onto like the star formation and the, the evolution of a galaxy through time. The reason we use iron is it's a lot easier to measure. And so while you might have iron abundances for uh, thousands of stars in a, in a large uh, dwarf galaxy, you might have a hundred uh, magnesium abundances. Yes. Thanks. So as time goes on, um, new new stars will form, right? Maybe some of those little core plus or whatever, and then you'll have more alpha elements. So as time goes on, then do you see that delay? Like, do you see this curve go up again, or maybe then that's like the name you were talking about? Like, would that then have a less severe flow? I don't know, because then maybe like it's time to step. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so to repeat and to see if I, uh, the, the question is like whether time goes on, does the, the leg of the, this, this, this distribution like change in slope or? Yeah, does it come back up again as we start form and then we just pop out? 
Um, so I think the, the way to think about this is that this is the distribution of stars uh, that a galaxy forms like over time. And so you can kind of walk through like um, from left to right, like what is uh, stars form at the abundance that uh, the, the, the line shows um, as you move left to right. Um, if you do, maybe this is answering your question better. If you were to have like a new burst of star formation, yeah. um, then you would have more of these core collapse supernova happening. Um, and this could uh, cause, maybe the line starts going down and then you have a burst of star formation for one reason or another. This could bump you back up kind of yeah. this way. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, so I guess that it's a good point. I, I, uh, the reason why the iron abundance tends to be the kind of the, the x-axis is because historically that's what we've had the most measurements of. To create this plot, you do need to have both. Um, yeah, otherwise you are just creating the, this bottom histogram. But it is the same thing. Yeah, yeah. To be able to, to make this plot, you have to have both measurements. Yeah. These questions are all very welcome because the next slide is just if, a question about if you have any questions. So continue to ask them if you have them. Yes. Um, why does it end at uranium? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a nuclear. <laughs> The question is, why does this periodic table stop here and not go further? Um, it's a good question. And I think my guess is the person who created this periodic table, um, being an astronomer themselves, uh, I think most of the elements that are heavier than uranium are largely synthetic in origin being produced like in labs and that's why we know about them, but don't, but like technetium and I don't know what this one is, um, but, but these ones are also like not, they, they have such short uh, lifetimes that they all decay if they are formed in, in, in naturally in the universe. Yes. Um, the question is, why are alpha elements harder to measure than the iron elements? I will answer that question later. Yeah, but it's a good question. Cool. I'm going to move on to Eridanus 2. Um, as I mentioned before, this is a, is a quite low mass, though not the most extremely low mass galaxy, um, with a stellar mass of 10 to the 5 solar masses. Um, it's very old, um, as I'll show in a second. Um, and it's located quite far away at about 370 kiloparsecs. For scale, the radius of the Milky Way is about 15 kiloparsecs. And so this is, if you can imagine, quite far away, um, which is why it hasn't been studied in more detail before. Um, as further evidence that it's quite low mass and small, um, it is very hard to actually look at this and, and see the galaxy. Um, if you get really close, we get the room really dark and you get really close, you might be able to see that there's like an overdensity of stars there, but it's quite hard to see um, against the, the background of stars. Um, but it turns out that if you go and you take really deep, long images um, of Eridanus 2 and you construct what we call a color magnitude diagram, where on the y-axis is the, like the brightness of the stars and on the, the x-axis is the color of the star, like one filter versus another, um, you see that that's kind of distinctive uh, shape pops out. Um, and this is um, a, a consequence of stars um, evolving um, into their later stages. This uh, vertical-ish line is the red giant branch. And so this is kind of one of the later stages of low mass, uh, low mass stellar evolution. You can see the horizontal branch here too. Um, the details are not too, too important other than um, in addition to helping identify that this is in fact a astrophysical system and not just a slight overdensity of stars in the Milky Way, um, you can uh, 
convert this, this data set along with our understanding of how stars evolve in this color brightness space with age. And you can measure the star formation history of Eridanus too, right? So I mentioned that the stellar populations of galaxies provide this, this fossil record. Um, and this is uh, one case, one specific example of how that can be used. So we can look at this and realize that, oh, most of these stars are, you know, 13 billion years old. And so they had to form 13 billion years old. Some look like they're more like 12 billion years old. And so they, they formed here. And um, the end result of these, this measurement is that we find that Eridanus II, uh, at very early times, um, you know, at the very beginning of the universe, uh, was forming stars quite rapidly. And then over uh, time, this, uh, the rate that it was forming stars decreased very rapidly. Um, to the point where after about a billion years, um, it had completely stopped forming its stars. It had formed all of the stars it ever was going to form. Um, so Eridanus II, uh, small, very old. Um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that means that it's a really good probe of what galaxy evolution was like in the very, very early universe. And so it's natural that we want to go and follow up and measure the chemical composition of this, these stars. And so this was attempted. Um, through spectroscopy is the primary mode of, of measuring uh, stellar chemistry, where you uh, the elements that are in a star's atmosphere uh, leave absorption lines in, in the stellar spectrum, and you can use those to measure abundances, um, the, the chemical composition. And so this is what this one group did. But this galaxy being so far away um, and so small, they were very limited in what they could actually measure. This is kind of the limit that they were able to go down to. Um, and so they measured iron abundances for 16 stars. And that's great. That tells us like that this was a pretty metal poor uh, galaxy. For reference, the sun is, is zero on this plot by uh, construction. Um, and so this is considerably more, more uh, metal poor, more unenriched. Um, but if we want to get more stars and actually be able to say more quantitative things about the galaxy evolution, um, we have to get creative. Um, and that's what uh, Sal Fu, who is another grad student um, in the astronomy department, has done. And it turns out that you don't actually need to get the full spectrum of a star if you want to measure iron abundances. You can take um, very, very narrow band in wavelength space uh, images um, that are centered around this uh, feature in the spectrum called the calcium H and K absorption lines. And these are very sensitive to the overall uh, it abundant, uh, iron abundance uh, in a star's atmosphere. And so it, with this method, you can go significantly deeper in this uh, galaxy. Uh, you can go to significantly fainter stars in this galaxy's uh, color magnitude diagram um, and increase our sample from just 16 stars to now 60 stars. Um, and so by doing this, we now actually have a, a sample that is large enough to do more statistical uh, cal uh, comparisons to, to models and figure out what actual physics is going on in, in this galaxy. So that's when it was kind of handed over to me. Um, and the, the main way you, that you can do this investigation is by using a, a galactic chemical evolution model where you, know, you have all of these inflows and outflows and various enrichment events um, that uh, I described earlier. Um, and if you uh, apply equations to these various uh, interactions between the various systems, um, you end up with a differential equation, which you can solve either analytically or, or numerically. Um, and with this model, which predicts how the galaxy enriches itself over time and forms new stars, um, you can predict a distribution uh, of stars in the system as a function of iron body, which is exac exactly what our, our measurements, our observables were. And so you can make these comparisons and you can actually fit for a number of uh, characteristics about this galaxy's evolution. I'll skip over like the, the numbers, which uh, are kind of meaningless without like extra context, but instead to paint like a qualitative picture of how uh, the, the, the narrative story of ARI 2's evolution. And so at very early times, ARI 2, we found that ARI 2, uh, fueled by vigorous accretion, began rapidly forming stars, albeit very inefficiently. Um, and then because of this very early, very rapid star formation, strong supernova driven winds drove both gas and newly produced iron out of the galaxy, um, which makes sense given that Eri 2 is so small that it has a very really hard time holding on to these, uh, to its gas. Um, 
And because of this low star formation efficiency and large outflows, only a small amount of that, a small fraction of the gas that has been accreted onto area two actually ends up forming into stars. Um, because outflows of, uh, over time outpace ac the accretion of new gas, the star formation history decays exponentially, um, such that roughly two thirds of area two's stellar mass formed within the first 400 million years and had formed nearly all of its stars by 1 billion years, which is in good agreement with what we found from the, the previous data set of just the, the, the photometry of area two. Um, the star formation history, we believe truncates a little after um, 1.4 billion years. Um, we think that this is because of both the, the energy input through these massive stars and supernovae that exist both in area two and potentially surrounding galaxies uh, effectively evaporates the remaining gas that area two has such that it can't form new stars. Um, and at the time of this truncation, um, roughly 90%, if not more, of the iron produced in area two has been ejected. And this is what keeps the, the, met, the iron abundance of the stars in area two so low. So uh, this uh, validates a lot of the things that are kind of intuitive or have been uh, predicted uh, to be the case for, for low mass galaxies. But this shows really the constraining power of having these the chemical composition of stars, even just iron abundances, allows you to place relatively strong constraints on on some of these uh, galactic processes. So I'll pause here if there are any questions about how this study uh, was done. Yeah. So the, the question is whether um, the, the, like, the reason that Area 2 formed uh, it is so low mass at the end of its evolution because it started as low mass. And I think largely the answer is yes. It kind of sounds a little obvious, but a lot of uh, a galaxy's evolution depends on its kind of initial uh, dark matter halo mass and how much gas it starts with. If you start bigger, you are able to continue to accrete more gas. You end up uh, uh, forming stars later um, in, in cosmic time, um, like the Milky Way. The Milky Way is much more massive. And so it's been able to, over time, continue to accrete new gas, accrete other galaxies, give it more gas. And so that's why the Milky Way is still forming stars now. Um, that was not the case for Area 2 and a lot of other dwarf galaxies, which were so small that they were easily influenced by various things in the early universe, which prematurely truncated their, their evolution. Yes. Um, yeah, the question is like, wh why did it vigorously accrete in the first place? And I think that it's a little hard to know because that's one of the things that we can't directly observe. Um, I, uh, I think part of it is that it's a relative term, what vigorously accreted means here for a low mass galaxy. Um, but yeah, and then I think that it's just a little hard to say confidently one way or the other. Cool. Um, so that brings me to the end of talking about Eridanus 2. Um, and looking at the clock, because we've been answering questions kind of as we go, I think that I'll be ambitious and talk a little bit about um, stellar spectroscopy and get around to the question that was asked earlier about why um, certain elements are harder to measure than others. Um, but I want to start by saying that um, Eridanus 2 is just one galaxy of many. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, this number of, of low mass galaxies in the local group is, is increasing more and more and will continue to increase in the next decade due to these very wide area imaging surveys done by the Roman Space Telescope and the Via Rubin Observatory, which are predicted to measure or to discover hundreds plus of new low mass galaxies and other stellar substructures in the local universe, um, uh, both in the local group and out to a few megaparsecs out beyond just our local group. Uh, where we can resolve the individual stars as I was talking about. Um, discovery is one thing, that's great. Oh, we love counting galaxies. That's a very powerful tool to understanding galaxy evolution. 
Um, but I hope earlier that I've motivated why getting the chemical composition is, is valuable and important. Um, and so we need to combine these imaging surveys with upcoming spectroscopic surveys as well. Fortunately, I have plenty of these, both currently ongoing and in the next, uh, on, on the, uh, in the process of getting up and running. Um, and by the 2030s and 40s, we'll have acquired spectra for upwards of 50 million stars throughout the Milky Way and local group. Um, and this, of course, is complemented by like, targeted follow-up using uh, existing and, and future large uh, telescopes like Keck, which we have access to here at UC, as well as JWST and in the future 30 meter class telescopes as well. Um, a point that I want to mention, and it uh, might not mean much right now, but I hope to, to motivate why this is an important thing, is that um, roughly 75% of these spectra that we'll be acquiring are going to be at low spectral resolution. Um, and I'll show some examples of what that means. And as we go to larger and larger distances, that becomes kind of universally true. We have to go to these lower quality spectra to be able to get an appreciable number of stars. And so I've spent a lot of time over the course of my PhD, I would actually say this has been the focus of my, my PhD, has been trying to understand what we can actually measure from these low resolution spectra. Um, because in the ideal case, we go and we get high resolution spectra that are high signal to noise. And in these spectra, you can go and you can find absorption lines that correspond to the element that you care about. These are like well isolated, and you can measure what we call the equivalent width, the, essentially the area that these absorption lines um, encompass. And you can convert these equivalent widths into an actual chemical abundance pattern uh, or chemical compositions. Um, but unfortunately, um, the spectra that we acquire don't look as pretty as this fake one that I've uh, made. They look closer to this fake one, which I've added realistic noise to. Um, this is on a full night of observing on a 10 meter telescope, one of the biggest in the world, um, at high resolution of a single star. Um, and you get about a single to noise of 15, and it looks quite messy. Um, and the reason that you know high resolution is is challenging uh, at, uh, for faint stars is because we've spread out the light so much in these observations um, that the the signal to noise is bad. They have low throughput, kind of inherent to their construction, and frequently you can only observe one star at a time. So to get around this, we go to lower resolution, um, and you can see that now that I've gone to lower resolution in this the spectrum, the noise has definitely gone down. But you'll notice that the trade off here. Um, is that the lines are much weaker and they're much broader. Um, and so you can't measure these equivalent widths anymore. If you look at our beautiful yttrium lines here, um, they're now a wash in blended features with neighboring absorption features. Um, this isn't the end of the world. Um, you can still measure abundances from these spectra, but instead of measuring individual absorption lines, you have to fit the full spectrum at the same time so that you're accounting for all of these blends. This is much more computationally intensive, um, you have to rely on stellar models, uh, of stellar atmospheric models and radiative transfer codes that can produce realistic synthetic spectra to compare to the data. But it's doable. It's harder, but it's doable. And then the question, of course, and the one that I set out to answer was what chemical information remains here? Um, just to kind of pull the room, what kind of information, or what kind of aspects of a spectrum do people think go into uh, how well you can measure a given uh, element in a star. Yeah, so the, the, how much element, how much of an element there actually is in the atmosphere. That is definitely true. Yeah, so this is a, a, a more subtle effect, but it does happen where like um, we can only measure the elements that actually are in the atmosphere of a star, and sometimes elements settle out of the atmosphere, um, making them harder to, to, to see. Yeah. Yeah, so the, yes, so if you see uh, magnesium, a lot of magnesium, you're more likely to also see a lot of oxygen because those uh, are both alpha elements and likely produced in about rel uh, re related quantities. Yeah, 
What about the spectra of more like instrumental? Yeah, there can be stuff in the way and uh, gas in between you and the star, which can like masquerade as being in the star itself. No, these are all great. Um, and definitely things that, that you have to take into account. Um, a few other aspects that uh, are more inherent to like the instrument itself uh, are the, the wavelength coverage, like what portions of the spectrum you're actually measuring. If there's not a magnesium line in there, then it's gonna be hard to measure magnesium. Um, uh, the spectral resolution, as I talked about, if lines are more blended, they're harder to, to measure. They're also not as strong. Um, Signal to noise, how long are you like staring at uh, an object to get the data? Um, and one that's a little bit more tricky, but is actually related to what people have already offered, which is um, this, the spectral gradients, which is how much the absorption features change as a function of the actual composition of the element. And it turns out that the more uh, of a given element you have, the stronger those lines are and the stronger those lines change as you were, if you were to like add more of that element or add less of that element. Um, and to kind of, uh, show to, to break this kind of abstract concept down a little bit. Um, if uh, here I'm showing this gradient spectrum for a star. So this is like, if you were to increase the iron abundance by uh, a given amount, this is how the spectrum would change, showing that a lot of uh, iron lines in, first of all, there are a lot of iron lines in the spectrum. Um, and a lot of these lines would get deeper um, as you add more iron in. Uh, and so there's a lot of iron absorption features. Um, this is why iron is relatively easy to measure in the star spectrum. Magnesium, on the other hand, has more moderate gradients. There are substantially fewer star uh, absorption lines corresponding with magnesium, and they're relatively weaker, although there's some good strong ones in there. And then to kind of show the, the extreme end of this, you have something like yttrium, which has like only three substantial lines in the spectrum. And so it's very hard to measure yttrium in, in a star. So, so those are, that's what I mean by spectral gradients. Um, how do you turn this into a, how do you quantify this chemical information in the star? You can fit mock data, but this is expensive, especially if you wanna check a whole bunch of different instruments and different types of stars and different observing conditions. Um, so you can use, a, a statistical technique, and I'll, I'm gonna warn everybody, there's an equation on this. I'm running late on time, low on time, so I will not go into the details, but you can use this statistical tool called the Fisher Information Matrix. And this is just a clever way of uh, taking your uh, aspects of the spectrum and converting it into an expected precision. Um, I did this for many, many stars, or sorry, many, many, uh, spectrographs existing in future. Um, I will just jump through this really quick because through this example and show you the one that's a little bit more exciting, um, which is trying to answer the question of how far can we go with our instruments, um, right? So this is kind of a depiction of all of the galaxies in the like local universe. The Milky Way is this big red circle here. Everything I've been talking about in the local group kind of falls within this dashed line within one megaparsec of us. Um, but there's a lot of interesting things when you get out to five megaparsecs, um, including some nearby other galaxy groups um, like San A, which is the nearest elliptical ga galaxy. Um, and so if we can start probing the chemical composition of an elliptical galaxy on a star-by-star -star basis, this opens up a huge new window in which we can study a different type of galaxy um, as, it, as it evolves over time. Um, so, one of the instruments that I looked at um, to do these very distant observations is JWST, which has an instrument on it called NearSpec, which provides very high spatial resolution, um, but relatively low spectral resolution. Um, but you can see that its spectrum, it covers the near infrared, and there are a lot of absorption lines, which I've highlighted here. And you can use this forecasting technique that I briefly introduced um, to uh, show what the expected precision of abundances for, for near spec would be as a function of distance. And that's what I show here on the right, where the, the x-axis is the distance of a star and the y-axis is the expected precision with higher precision being low, uh, small uncertainties. Um, 
And this is just to show that at the distance of Andromeda, which is M31 here, um, the predicted precision for, for alpha and iron um, is, and for several other elements are close to what the precision we currently are getting in the Milky Way is. Um, and then as you get out to about you know, three megaparsecs or so, we're, we're still able to get precision that is close to what's currently in the local group. Um, so this is to say that JWST and also other large telescopes on the horizon can really push out um, our uh, ability to do science to, to greater and greater distances. And this is really exciting. And I'm excited to see what we find through these instruments in the next decade or so. So with that, I'll, I'll flash on my conclusions. I talked about Eridanus II's chemical evolution and the various things that we can learn about a galaxy's chemical enrichment over time. And I talked very briefly about how stellar spectroscopy is used to make these measurements and what the future has for those. Uh, happy to take questions in the last few minutes we have. Um, thanks. Yeah, Jackie. Um, so your observations are in this optical and near infrared. Are there other astrophysical advances you can use to study solar galaxies or other wavelengths? Yeah, so the question is, um, most of the examples I showed had optical or near infrared spectra. Um, are there other wavelengths that are useful? Um, I think the uh, something I didn't have time to show, but something that we found um, was that spectra, solar spectra are really information rich in the blue optical. Um, in the ultraviolet, this is just where there's a lot of uh, trans electron transitions for atoms. Um, and so if you can kind of focus on that regime, um, there's a lot more that you can learn about a star's composition. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, why is the galaxy called Eridanus 2? Uh, why Eridanus, why 2? Um, Dwarf galaxies typically follow the convention, uh, the naming convention, that they're named first after the constellation that they are found inside of. Um, and then if you find multiple uh, galaxies within a constellation, then they increase in Roman numeral. This is not universally true because it turns out that when you get to small systems, it's hard to tell uh, dwarf galaxies apart from other like globular star clusters, like globular clusters. And those have a different naming convention where they're named after the person or the survey that found them. And then that increments with Roman, num uh, sorry, with Arabic numerals. Um, and it turns out that sometimes when somebody finds something that they think is a dwarf galaxy, it later turns out to be a globular cluster or vice versa, and they don't always rename them. So it's not, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so, how common um, were like for was the formation of dwarf galaxies as opposed to higher mass galaxies in the early universe? And maybe we see like a lower proportion of dwarf galaxies compared to the hard to observe, or maybe the density fluctuations that form galaxies were smaller, so we saw more. So the question is, um, what is like the relative number of uh, like dwarf galaxies versus more massive galaxies? Um, and I, uh, dwarf galaxies are much more numerous, but you're right that like they are harder to find. And so you have to kind of correct for the selection effects in surveys to, to go from the number of galaxies that you actually see to the number of galaxies that you think are out there. So if you've heard of something called the missing, uh, missing satellites problem, I think is um, what it was called is the idea that our understanding of cosmology from lambda cold dark matter cosmology predicted a certain number of galaxies. And we saw way fewer low mass galaxies than the theory predicted. And so people are like, ah, it's all wrong, it's broken. Um, but it turns out that they're just hard to see. And so we weren't seeing as many. Um, and now that you know, uh, more sensitive surveys are coming online, we're, we're filling in the things that we thought were missing. They're still there. They're, they're, they're there, they're, we're just hard to see. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.